Did Sinclair influence your life? More about this and other stories on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Can a pinball arcade save a small town? Retroarch appears on Steam. Joust flaps onto the cocoa. And the passing of Sir Clive Sinclair. All this and more on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. Neil, I can't remember. What, what's the name of the town the cave currently has its foundation set in? Uh, the cave is in a little village called Chalford, which is just outside Stroud in Gloucestershire. Oh, okay. You know, I can't wait to get over there. Uh, but <laughs> besides the cave, uh, what else is going on in good old Stroud? What's the high street scene looking like these days? Well, Stroud is actually quite unique compared to um, some others because, uh, you know, the, the town center is in decline in just the same way nearly all other high streets are up and down the country here. The big names are vanishing and, and there's large empty shops. But in Stroud, those empty shops uh, are actually turning into other things. So where in other high streets, you've got landlords who haven't quite got with the times yet, and they're not adjusting their rent to come to terms with what's going on. The shops here are actually being occupied by things like independent record shops. We've got fruit and veg shops by independent sellers. We've got all kinds of fun things popping up. So it's quite nice to go down Stroud High Street on a Saturday on a on a sunny day at least um <laughs> yeah so stroud is a bit more forward looking than other places and that's probably not the answer you were expecting from me john <laughs> well that's fantastic i'm glad to hear a success story because i can tell you um that you know that the high street uh which we call main street of course here in the states uh where i live in beautiful hurricane west virginia is not exactly hopping but just like uh, what's going on in Stroud, there are some some changes being made. Uh, we've had a new pizza place open up that actually imported a wood-fired oven from Italy. This was a big Ooh. brick thing. <laughs> they actually had to take the windows out of this of the storefront to crane this thing in. Craned. That's that's a verb, right? <laughs> um, and get this, Neil. We're also opening up an Irish pub. Never mind. I've never once ever heard of any actual Irish people residing here in West Virginia. I'm sure it'll be a totally authentic experience as far as Irish pubs go. But you know what we don't have, Neil? We don't have John Yates. You see, Neil, according to a story shared with us by subreddit user Mobeast68w, Mr. Yates decided to start collecting pinball machines while he was a college student in Indiana. Uh, he was an entrepreneur from an early age, and he started setting up vending machines around his college. So when he needed a place to store them, he found this kind of abandoned shack, and he tracked down its owner, and he was actually granted permission to store his machines there, provided he, in the words of the shack owner, cleaned out the junk in them. Uh, do you know what that <laughs> junk was, Neil? 15 um, pinball uh, machines uh, that, how can you call that junk <laughs> right <laughs> let's go where are these sheds where are these sheds if you have one of these sheds please call me i'm i'm very willing to clean out your junk so anyway john yates he moved to silicon valley to work in tech after college but he didn't stop collecting machines in fact he started buying so many he actually started acquiring real estate in a small town nearby where he went to college in indiana the small town is called mclean um in fact, uh, when he burned out from working in the tech industry, he moved back to McLean himself, and he soon owned, by his own estimation, two-thirds of McLean's downtown square. It's pretty crazy. Uh, so what does John Yates do? Well, he opens up uh, two gaming venues, Arcadia, which, the name, as the name suggests, is full of classic arcade machines, and Pinball Paradise which houses a vast collection of pinball machines. So uh, not a bad way to exercise those tech stock options, eh, Neil? Yeah, um, a, a couple of points. I imagine there are lots of people in Hurricane who identify as being Irish. <laughs> so I'm sure That's they'll true. get down to that Irish bar and get a pint of That's Guinness. True. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this sounds like a man who played far too much SimCity. He's taking over that town, uh, 
But, right. you know, he's, he's doing it for reasons which I like, to put arcades and pinball machines in there. And I, I'd hope that people would travel far and wide to, to come and visit and in doing so perhaps bring more trade to the town. If there aren't many other attractions to the town, it, it might bring more people in. Um, I'd certainly sooner go to Arcadia than I would Disneyland. I can tell you that. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what's the story here, John, then? Man opens arcade in small town. Is it a case of if you build it, they will come? Is that what he's going for? Well, kind of. Um, According to the story, which is, of course, linked in the show notes, the buildings serve anywhere from a few dozen up to 200 customers a day. Uh, In addition, Mr. Yates has opened four different arcade-themed Airbnbs. Uh, You know how popular Airbnbs are, especially in this time of pandemic where people aren't necessarily rushing back out to hotels. And these Airbnbs uh, come complete with retro-inspired furniture and a couple machines in them themselves. So that's pretty pretty neat. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I could get on board with that. Um, So is this a story with a happy ending? Man saves small town from the brink of uh, destruction through retro gaming. Is that the story here? Well, surprisingly, no, Neil, uh, or maybe oh. unsurprisingly. Uh, it, it seems that Mr. Yates has made a few enemies in his small town oh, since dear. his arrival. Uh, because his arcades aren't exactly bringing in major revenue. I mean, if you can think about he owns two-thirds of the town square, and the on some days there's only a couple dozen people that come in, you know, that's that might not be the same as if a, a traditional business was there. Uh, he keeps having to change banks. Because nobody wants to deal with his bags of quarters. <laughs> there was one bank. They said, our change m- machine broke when you brought in your quarters and we're not getting a new one. Please take your business <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> so, and, uh, and he's been flat out refused when he's offered to buy even more buildings in the town square up for his collection. So uh, what, what do you make of this, Neil? I mean, you revitalize a downtown area and this is the thanks you get. Do you have such enemies over in Stroud, Neil? <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Um, <laughs> the first thing it makes me think is, uh, what's the guy doing wearing out all of his coin mechs? Why doesn't he just put them on free play and charge? Yeah, and entry? yeah. <laughs> that's right (laughs) seems like a simple solution but um yeah the problem as i see it from your description it's more to do with power i think than it is to do with the arcades themselves because if one person owns the majority of your town center just think about the influence that that person has you know on Mm -hmm. your life and on the success of the town that that's not an environment that's conducive to good democratic outcomes it's quite the opposite and um you know that's the beauty of my local town the big guys have moved out the little people are filling in the vacuum and we're seeing varied and a really eclectic mix of shops which uh, actually make you want to go into the town center and um Mm -hmm. you've still got the out of town supermarkets the great big places if you want to go to them and they of course kind of double that they're now part supermarket part warehouse for online grocery shopping so they're well placed to adapt and survive i don't think anyone's really worried about those places but back Mm -hmm. in them in the town center um you know i I say mr yates maybe wind it back a little bit you've got your arcade there you've got your airbnbs maybe put arcades in other towns and uh, isn't it a real american thing to get a franchise going Get your franchise. Nothing setup. more American. Yeah. Nothing yeah, more build American. Those than arcades, a good build your mm-hmm. muck arcades all over the United States and, and people will thank you for it. I think that's a better direction. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, now, it's it's not all bad news, of course. Mr. Yates does have friends on the village council. Uh, they recognize having any business is better than buildings vacant and falling apart. Because uh, if you you know, as you know, if you don't put something in buildings, buildings decay and they they literally you know the roofs fall in and all that stuff. And so, and of course, some of his fans are the legions of arcade and pinball fans that visit his property. So, if you're ever in the normal uh, Bloomington area, and that's the name, normal dash bloomington area of indiana and get over to mclean for an afternoon uh leave us a comment in the subreddit i want to go to weird bloomington never mind normal bloomington. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so retro arch uh, in our next story uh, it's featured before it'll be well known to many listeners If not, it's a front end from which you can launch your favorite emulated systems. And it's the favored front end on the popular Retro Pi setup for the Raspberry Pi to create a low cost and fairly easy to use emulation setup. It's not exclusive to the Pi though. It does run on lots of other systems. And the news this week is that that front end has now appeared for download on the Steam service. 
thrusting it into the limelight of modern PC gamers to download and try out. I'm not sure if I've asked you this before, John. I know it's come up in conversation, but are you a fan of RetroArch? Is that a part of your own setup? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I prefer using a front end called CoinOps. CoinOps. So uh, when I want to switch back and forth between multiple machines, and CoinOps is mostly based on MAME, which, as you know, has incorporated Mess into it. So it now can uh, emulate a wide variety of different machines. But really, these days, the majority of my retro gaming is, is done on the good old Mr. Oh, you're a Mr. Man now. You're <laughs> Mr. Man, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I've got a few RetroPie setups myself, which I do enjoy. But, of course, RetroPie goes beyond just the RetroArch front end. You know, RetroArch can run on a regular PC. And um, you, from it, you can launch cores, cores being the emulators for the various systems. And, um, well, before we get onto the Steam version of RetroArch, I, I just wanted to talk a bit more in general about Steam. Because I don't know about you, John, but um, whenever I've got a bit of free time, which isn't that often, I'll sit down at Steam and I'll think, I've got a bit of spare time, I'm going to play some games. And, and I find that I have a hell of a time picking out a new game to play. I don't know if that's just me. If something does grab my attention, uh, I'm super suspicious that it might still be in a kind of beta testing stage. Uh, so I have to check that. Is it complete? Are there updates out for it? What do the reviews say? Are there artificially planted reviews to bump up the score or are there real reviews in there from people saying yeah give it another six months it's not complete that kind of thing you've got to do all these checks before you buy a game now it's a nightmare rather than just buying a magazine once a month and seeing what the review score is in the old days and uh, there's nothing worse than picking a game and realizing that you've you've effectively paid for a tech demo and then maybe you'll wait patiently and a, a year later the devs They'll release version 1.0 of the game, but it's clear that basically they've given up on it because they're already working on another game. They've, they've learned their lessons and they've moved on and they've kind of left you with this half complete game. Um, yeah, I'm having a bit of a rant now, but I know that that's not a problem that's exclusive to Steam. It happens in a lot of places, but as Steam is my main outlet for gaming these days, that's the kind of problem I find myself experiencing. Uh, is your experience similar with Steam, John? It, sort of whenever i go on there i guess i just have a different set of problems where somebody will say oh you need to check out this this great game that i just found on steam so you go on the page and you hover over that buy button you know pc games by and large are pretty affordable these days at least the the indie games sort of scene that i'm most into and so you know you can usually get out the door for less than 20 bucks with a lot of these games but then as soon as i'm about ready to click on that buy button i have a look at my library page and i notice that i have anywhere between you know two and three hundred games that i've bought and not even installed yet uh, and, and I just think to myself, boy, do I need to add another game to the pile of games that I haven't <laughs> played? And, you know, with things like Humble Bundle and the Steam, you know, biannual sales, you just end up with just piles and piles of legitimately great uh, PC games. And um, once you once you get them, you just you, you tend to forget about them. And, and then you have this choice paralysis where you <laughs> you have so many games, you can't make a choice. I end up just shutting it down and firing up, you know, my my NES emulator or my my <laughs> FSUAE edition of Amiga or whatever. And, and it, that's what keeps me coming back to the classic games, because I'm just I get so stressed out about all these new games that I haven't had a chance to play yet. And I don't know which one to start with. Well, um, well, now you can keep Steam open because you could launch RetroArch within it soon. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. Problem solved. Problem solved. Problem solved. Um, <laughs> it is funny looking through your library. Steam is almost retro in itself. It's been around for so long now. So I like I can mm -hmm. look in my library and I can say, oh, yeah, I was playing Silent Hunter 3 15 years ago or whatever it is. And you can see how many hours right. you put into it. It'll be sad if that service ever disappears and you lose that little... Um, diary of your own gaming history i think hopefully it'll not to mention your entire time. library of games you know that's that's always been the well, big fear yeah. that steam never <laughs> goes away <laughs> yeah so uh back on topic with retro arch on steam the, the first thing you'll notice about the steam page for this product is that there isn't a single screenshot on here of a well-known game or system running no marios no sonics no playstation splash screen or anything like that so they're obviously walking a very, very fine tightrope of copyrights and trademarks and, and getting this into the store. 
and try and not to enrage the Nintendos or the Segas of the world. So um, that that's quite an interesting observation. And the next thing I picked up from the reviews on the page for it is that um, it seems to come with a limited number of emulators or cores, and users aren't particularly happy with the ones that were chosen. And if they want to change some of them or add more cores, some people have found that they're unable to change them on the Steam version of RetroArch, uh, and others have started providing support in the reviews with terminal commands that you can run to overcome the issues. It's it's not really surprising. What it really reveals is that juggling of front ends with emulators, it needs a bit of work. You need to get a bit of understanding mm-hmm. of how the system works, and you need to put some time into it to get the best out of it. And I think we all understand that. So it's not necessarily a big criticism. Um Of course, what it does mean, though, is that when people start getting the Steam Deck, and I think this is the real story here, that um, and the Steam Deck is Steam's own gaming tablet that's coming out soon. Lots of people have pre-ordered it. Um, This may well be used to launch retro games via RetroArch on the Steam Deck nice and easily, uh, thanks to its availability on Steam. And that is probably the longer term goal here with this move. So maybe you get your Steam Deck, you can fire up Gran Turismo on the PlayStation um, via RetroArch or a bit of Manic Miner on the Spectrum emulator via RetroArch, whatever it is that you want to run with that front end configured nicely. So with that in mind, when you put it in that context, I think it's a move that will be welcomed by many. And uh, the reviews on the whole on Steam are positive for this. So it does look like it's heading in a good direction. John, John, I don't know if we've talked about the Steam Deck. Have you pre-ordered one yourself? Uh, no, I, I am sort of interested in it. The idea of a handheld PC that's relatively affordable where I can play games on the go. I'm going to wait and see for it. You know, I'm going to wait and look at the reviews as they come in. But uh, it could be a legitimate alternative to something like the Switch, which is what I used to play all my games on now, just because I already have that you know fully populated Steam backlog library of games to play. Yeah, I think that's a wise stance to take. We'll wait and see how it how it plays, how it lasts after a few months of intensive gaming. Do, do these things fall mm-hmm. apart or are they well made? But this could be the icing on the cake. RetroArch in Steam, this could really seal it for me and I'll be watching it with interest. Neil, it's always exciting news when an arcade port comes to a home micro. Of course, the original pitch of these games was to save you pocket money by eliminating the quarter, or in your case, the the 10p charge once and for all. But there was also the secondary benefit of theoretically being able to practice up your skills at home. So when you did venture forth into the local arcade, you could fill the high score tables with your own initials, cementing your dominance on the scene. Now, Neil, do you remember playing a game in an arcade and running out and buying or acquiring the home port on the cpc or the amiga yeah arcades were just a huge inspiration for what your next gaming choice would be weren't they um Mm -hmm. i would say games like spy hunter was definitely one of them um apb was another which i first played while on holiday in america um there was an arcade in a place called main street usa (laughs) oh that's um, that's at disney yeah, it was right? part of Disney, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a, an upstairs arcade with just hundreds of machines. It was like heaven. And I remember the sit-down APB with the big heavy steering wheel that you could just sling and it would spin and spin and spin, made to look like a you know an old American cop car or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I rushed home and got that for my Amiga, which was a pretty good port. Um, of course, Outrun. I'm just listing driving games at the moment. Um, <laughs> Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair Mm -hmm. was the game that made me go out and buy a 512k RAM expansion for my Amiga because you needed that to run it. Um, You can judge for yourselves whether that particular game was a wise move or not, but it got me a RAM (laughs) expansion and I enjoyed it at the time. So yeah, Yeah, just a a whole list of inspiration. Yeah. How about you, John? Well, my Atari computer never got any ports past the golden age of arcade games, really, uh, which I was mostly too young to enjoy in the arcades themselves. By the time I was going to arcades, you couldn't really find Asteroids and, and Pac-Man so much anymore. But later on in my teen years, I remember playing Killer Instinct when that entered the scene in the arcades. Do you remember that fighting game? 
I do, I do, with the fabled Ultra 64 advertising built right into the game that used to flash up. Um, Mm -hmm. Nintendo's promised console, which turned out to have completely different hardware to what the the arcade machines were advertising. (laughs) But, you know, it was good advertising. And um, I I should point out, because we're pretty much the same age, when I played games like Spy Hunter, they were already old in the arcades. Um, Mm -hmm. We also had, I remember we had Pac-Man. Uh, we had mm-hmm. a Pac-Man machine that once got jammed up with 10 pence pieces so that the coin mech was pushed down and we had an entire day of free Pac-Man. It was the best oh day ever. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it's not that I'm any older. It's just that I was in these arcades um, on British seafronts that just seemed to keep the arcades going by the sounds of it for longer than our American right. counterparts, although yeah. yeah, I'm sure you had places that kept them going as well. Uh, well, there were, yeah, I mean, and don't get me wrong, there were still, like, if you went to a Pizza Hut, you would still find a Miss Pac-Man in there, but uh, sure. you know, I definitely wasn't playing anything beyond the the sort of greatest hits of the golden era. Uh, I, I never saw a Mr. Do, uh, for example, uh, in, in any arcade I went to. I do think that in America, we tended to swap games out for newer games uh, faster, and I think we also made the transition transition maybe over to the dreaded redemption machines uh quicker than you guys did mm-hmm. in the uk which was a real blow to the arcade scene yeah quite possibly uh, yeah you mentioned mr do i remember playing that well into the playstation era they were they were always oh, at wow. the back of the arcade they weren't at the front mm-hmm. because you needed the new stuff right. to attract people in but i could find right. them lingering down at weymouth seafront where i used to frequent so yeah killer mm-hmm. instinct as well i remember that well too yeah yeah, yeah. So, you know, Killer Instinct was part of that rare Nintendo pol- uh, partnership that really blossomed in the the mid 90s. And uh, I remember playing that in the arcade and deciding uh, I was like, OK, this is going to be the game that I'm going to get really good at. So I went out and I bought the Super Nintendo version with the hopes that upon revisiting the arcade, I would walk in and, and people would just fear me. I would I would wipe the floor with all challengers. Well, unfortunately, I think everybody else had the same plan because I did get better at Killer Instinct practicing at home, but I was always soundly defeated in the arcade. So I don't know, Neil, I, I have a hard time performing under pressure. Oh, you did, did you? You're a, you're a shy gamer, John. You're a shy gamer. I am. Um, I had I, I had similar issues, to be honest. I, I didn't like people watching me. It happens play in the to arcade. lots of guys, Neil. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, play, playing in the arcade. You know, if I if I wasn't playing a game, I'd be standing over someone's shoulder watching because you just want to see the game in action. You want to see how it moves right. and what it's like, mm-hmm. and and you are making those decisions. Do I want to buy this for my home computer? Do I want to spend the 10, I've got 10, 10 pence pieces in my pockets. Do I want to use a 10th of my budget today on this particular game? And, and, uh, so I would watch the games, but I sure as hell didn't like being watched <laughs> like you. Yeah. yeah pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But now, now I have another chance to perfect my arcade game skills at home this time on the Tandy color computer that's sitting just over my shoulder here on my right. Uh, thanks to a story shared with us by subreddit user L Curtis Boyle. Uh, I've learned that you can now play what amounts to an arcade perfect version of the Williams classic joust on your color computer three. Thanks to a developer known as nowhere man, nine, nine, nine. Are you a fan of joust, Neil? Uh, yeah, I am a uh, fan of Joust, and not just Joust, but that whole era at the same time of Williams games, where they seem to put a lot of focus on giving every single game that they bought out um, a unique mechanic, something a bit different. So you had, whether it was Defender, Robotron, Joust, Sinistar, all of these games, they all had something unique about them that made you go back and play again and again. And, and flapping and jousting at the same time, oh, that's, <laughs> that's a fine example of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this is a game I've played on almost every platform I have in my collection. It's fantastic. Uh, But the version for the Coco, this version is different. Um, It's not an ordinary port. This is something called a transcode, okay? So as you know, ports involve programmers trying to recreate a game, uh, oftentimes from scratch. You hear all these stories about, you know, people, uh, developers from Ocean that uh, got the license to create an arcade game, but they didn't have access to any of the original sprites or the source code basically they went to the arcades themselves with a sketch pad you know and and, and taking some notes and they tried to recreate the game just by playing it so uh sometimes the results were great sometimes they were less than great um but uh you know as a result you end up with uh, a game that is similar yet unique to the platform but a transcode 
is different. You know, the Joust arcade machine originally ran on a Motorola 6809 processor. And the Tandy Com Color Computer 3 also runs on a 6809 processor. So with enough RAM to offload all of the game's assets, you can essentially use the processor to emulate a perfect version of the arcade machine on a computer that in its native format would struggle to run anything like a decent port. That's uh, pretty cool, wouldn't you say, Neil? That is very cool. I guess this has come about because of the availability of the original um, machine code for the arcade. So yes, absolutely. That's, that's been made available. Um, and then if the processor is the same processor running at the same speed or, or faster and the assets mm -hmm. are the same, well, then it's going to be identical, isn't it? You're going to get a true arcade experience. It sounds perfect. Yeah, yeah, I it's it's funny the way and I guess it's just because the Coco does use the the 6809 processor which uh I don't know of you know you always hear about the 6502 or the Z80 and things like that and uh so maybe that's why we haven't seen transcodes as common on on other systems but the the Coco has really made a name for itself with these transcodes uh, about 10 years ago a transcode of Donkey Kong was released you know it's very impressive followed up a few years later by Pac-Man uh, a Pac-Man transcode. And from what I hear, uh, there's actually a transcode of Defender currently in development, hopefully oh, wow. uh, yeah. with it. Yeah, hopefully uh, the, the controls will be such that I won't pull my hair out as I do whenever I try and play real Defender. <laughs> I'm assuming, John, that um, the, the resolution of the Coco must be very similar to the Williams machines um, and the graphics, they're looking pretty similar. Yeah, I know that on the Pac-Man transcode, uh, they actually, uh, you, the screen scrolls uh, for some reason, you know, it scrolls vertically. Although with the Donkey Kong transcode, that, that's not the case, even though that's a vertically oriented game too. So I think there is, there are still some some hoops you have to jump through in terms of getting everything to fit correctly on the Coco. But I mean, I'm telling you, when you watch that, uh, the attract screen come up and you start playing, you forget that what you're es essentially sitting in front of is you know a computer that was you know a, a very very inexpensive you know the coco was almost like our version of of the zx spectrum it was it was designed to be produced as cheaply as possible it was sold mass market through the radio shack chain of stores here in the united states and uh it's a, a very sort of hobbled machine technically speaking in many ways and it's it's just it's mind-blowing to see something arcade perfect on a machine like the Coco, it's 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 really cool. So, um, if you'd like to try out these games on a real Coco Three or through an emulator, they work through emulation too. Uh, just check out the link in the show notes and uh, make sure you check out Nowhere Man's blog. His real name is Glenn Hewitt. He is a master transcoder. Well, you mentioned the ZX Spectrum in our last story there, John, and our final story this week uh, ties up with that. It's all about the passing of Sir Clive Sinclair. He passed away aged 81 just this week, having been living with cancer for a decade, and his daughter Belinda said that he was working on projects right up until the week of his death. Such was his passion for inventing and creating new things with electronics. Sir Clive Sinclair is probably best known in the UK for his ZX Spectrum computer, but he did much more. For example, he created what's regarded as the world's first pocket calculator way back in 1972. Admittedly, you'd need quite a large pocket to put it in there, but it was considered a pocket calculator. And it was a great example of his innovation in trying to cost reduce and miniaturize technology for consumers. That is really the things that he was all about, cost reduction and miniaturization. In the case of the pocket calculator, um, he used a common calculator chip, which already existed. It was made by Texas Instruments. And what he found in trying to reduce the size of it was that its power consumption really wasn't suitable for pocket-sized devices. But between Sir Clive and Chris Curry at Sinclair Radionics, you may have heard of Chris Curry if you've watched Micro Men. He went on to um, uh, found and be a part of Acorn Computers, so he went on to become a competitor. But they were working together at Sinclair Radionics. And between them, they figured out that if you use a coin cell battery to get that size of the calculator down nice and small, and if you pulsed the power periodically rather than having the power on all the time, the residual power that was left in the circuit was enough to keep that TI calculator chip running. So that was the breakthrough they needed. And they were able to do away with large batteries and shrink the whole thing down. 
So Clive would then go on to create a range of calculators through the 70s, including a rather fancy looking Silver Jubilee edition for the Queen's 25th year on the throne. But I think that's a really nice example of just his alternative way of thinking, his problem solving, not to throw more money at it, but to find a different way around it to make it cheaper. And he really understood the importance of making technology cheaper and more accessible to to everyone here in the UK and beyond. Now, Sir Clive was dogmatic in persevering with projects and the quest for miniaturization. A good example would be, we move on from calculators now to his pocket televisions. Um, his first pocket television spanned 10 years of development in the 70s. Uh, millions was invested, some of which came to him through the government to fund this. So they obviously saw a use for a pocket television. And I say pocket television, <laughs> the first television, um, it, it, it's, it's. do you know what? I've got one. Let me go and grab it. Okay, I'm back with a bunch of Sinclair technology. So uh, I don't have a calculator to show you, but um, here in its carry case is uh, that pocket television that I'm talking about. So you can see what I mean yeah, when I say pocket. It's quite a you long... You carry it around as sort of a handbag type of size, yeah. <laughs> a man bag, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's what he created over a period of 10 years. Um, and then he did go on to evolve the design to this in the early 80s, which is a, a much... Oh, yeah, unit. much. Yeah. But it took a lot of development to get to that point. And of course, he mm -hmm. was taking on single handedly uh, the might of the Japanese and all of their miniaturization efforts. And he was beating them to the punch with a lot of these things. And in the case of the televisions, uh, the product was completed. It came to market. And while it proved that he could, the sales of them did leave some wondering whether he should have created such a device. But um, I'm not sure he was always so worried about that because he was first and foremost an inventor and um, he was probably pretty pleased that he managed to create these and, as I say, beat the Japanese to the punch. But what we were left in no doubt about with him, though, was his next project, a range of computers starting with the ZX80 in 1980, the 81 in 1981, and then codename ZX82, which became the ZX Spectrum in 1982. And what that did was it gave the UK a sub 100 pounds color computer with a Z80 processor, 16 or 48K of RAM with 16 soon being dropped and 48K becoming the standard and a keyboard. I mean, you were just talking about the, the Coco over in the US. Can you remember what that kind of retailed for? Are we in the sub 100 pounds 100 dollars category or was it a bit oh more no I, I don't i don't think we ever had a computer launch here in the states that retailed for less than 100 100 with the equivalent of 100 pounds that was something that you could only get in the uk yeah it it, it was a magnificent effort on his part um a huge cost reduction effort uh, and some <laughs> examples of that here is the zx spectrum by the way um, with a multi-face in the back because it didn't come with a joystick port as standard. So that, that's what I was using there. And then a, a printer port. Um, let's take that out. There you go. You can see the size of it. Just just a, just a real-time follow-up on that. The, the Tandy Color Computer was introduced as a budget computer, but it still came in at a price of $399 when it was first launched, which was definitely cheaper than the Apple II. Uh, you know, this came out in 1980. Definitely cheaper than the Atari 800, but still a long way away from the price of something like the ZX80 or 81 for sure. Yeah. And he achieved such cost reduction through things like the keyboard, which is nicknamed the dead flesh keyboard, such as his feel. <laughs> um, mm. <laughs> but it was a step up from the chiclet keyboards of the previous computers. Um, and another trick he had up his sleeve was Sir Clive bought faulty RAM. He bought because RAM was so expensive. So he would buy RAM mm -hmm. that was faulty and then only use half of the RAM chip, the good half of the RAM chip in the computer. And it worked a treat. I mean, this ZX Spectrum is still working nearly 40 years later with that dodgy RAM because it's just using the good part of it. So he uh, he was a very shrewd and clever inventor. Um, and, and the ZX Spectrum is probably his most well-known product. John, you're probably more familiar with the Sinclair machines on your side of the pond than, than most people um, because you have a podcast dedicated to it, Your Sinclair, I think your podcast is called. Our Sinclair. And, sorry, sorry, Your Sinclair was the magazine. Yes, our <laughs> That's Sinclair. That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does the passing of Sir Clive mean, mean to you, John? I, I've got to admit, this this came out of the blue for me. Uh, I, 
I, with people like Sir Clive, you just sort of assume they're going to live forever. Because when you see when you saw pictures of him, like you said, you, 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 pictures are released of him from time to time. And he always looked like he was in good health. He was still working on things. And um, and also, I thought he was just a little bit younger than 81. I, I've forgotten how much he'd accomplished since he started Sinclair back in, in 1961. Um, to me, he really represented the quintessential combination of engineer and entrepreneur. Um, he, he possessed the ability to see into the future and determine what products people might need. But at the same time, he had enough marketing savvy to realize that the quickest way to mass adoption was through producing a product that most people could afford. Uh, it didn't do it doesn't do people any good to, you know, release a product and, and it only be able to be afforded. You know, I guess there, there are two ways to look at it. You can start up market and your, work your way down. But if you really want quick mass adoption of a product, releasing it at a price point that makes pe- makes it a, an impulse purchase uh, is, is really a way to to really foster and and fund more innovation because you've got all this money coming in yeah yeah i think there were definitely elements of wozniak jobs and probably bill gates in there as well Mm -hmm. in the way that he operated you know he had a bit of everything and uh he did have a huge impact on the uk computing market but do you think sir clive had an impact on the u.s computing market in any way in the 80s when he was making waves over here in the uk or is he seen as more of a historical reference in the US? Is he seen as that guy who kickstarted the UK industry, but you had your own bubble over there in the US? How does it how does it come across there? Yeah, I, I hate to say it, Neil, but uh, I think it was more the latter, if I'm being honest. I think by and large, the UK computer scene did exist in its own bubble uh, for a variety of factors, not the least of which were economic. You know, As you know, in the early 80s, the UK was just emerging from its uh, sick man of Europe phase, as it was known, and, and the, the home computer market was taking off. And the need for an ultra affordable micro that cut every corner it could was more prevalent there then in the United States. Uh, Of course, we did get a spectrum of sorts here in the States. We got the the Timex Sinclair, but the market was already so crowded and it was so under-supported that it it didn't make any impact at all. Um, For some, you know awful reason they didn't make it compatible with any of the thousands of games available for the zx spectrum which is 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 crazy but um the the fact that the us and uk did sort of grow up in parallel computing universes makes it such a joy to explore all the great games on the specy we never got a chance to play growing up so i'm glad that things turned out the way that they did i get to kind of experience all these things that you grew up with for the first time and it's it's you know it's it's great Uh, i don't think you'll find bigger fans of the specy here in the states than Aaron or me. Uh, The Spectrum is an amazing computer, not just because of all the careers that helped launch and the fact that it put computers in millions of houses where there had been none before. But I mean, at the end of the day, it just has some truly, truly spectacular games. It does. Um, It it has a huge games library. Uh, Games, it seems, weren't really what Sir Clive had envisioned when he created the computer. Uh, He saw computers as being serious things for serious business. And um, you know, it did have its business uses, the, the the ZX Spectrum, but we really did pick it up in our bedrooms for gaming. Um, but I do hope in time that Sir Clive recognized that us kids who grew up using it for games, um, those games really were our point of entry into computing and we would go on to become confident and comfortable with computers. And many of us were inspired through the ZX Spectrum and the games that we played on them to, to pursue a career in IT and do those serious things eventually. So I don't think uh, we should dismiss it as a games machine. It, it, it inspired a whole lot more in a lot of us. So Clive was quite elusive in later years when it came to interviews. Um, I remember he was on the telly a lot in the 80s. He was quite a character. But he was he was perhaps burned by the negative press that was drawn to his Sinclair C5. So that came after the Spectrum, and that was his battery-powered vehicle. Um, if you needed any proof about his visions of the future, then the C5 was it. And I dare say it would be a hit today. Uh, it was just 30 years too early. Uh, and his nephew is indeed pursuing a project to create a new C5 and to to carry that on. So um, perhaps we'll we'll see new C5s on on the road, and his original vision uh, will be met. Um, of course, he also had the QL, which was a um, a follow up computer to the ZX Spectrum. Again, really pushing for that serious business side. It had a micro drive instead of cassettes to load things into. 
and um, that flopped. So he did have a period of slightly negative press, and that might explain why we didn't hear much from him in later years. But despite not hearing from him, I think really his body of work speaks for itself. He was an innovator. He was a pioneer. And uh, Sir Clive was a person for who many of our listeners, uh, he would have had a profound effect on our lives, more so than any rock star, any writer or any artist. And for that effect that he had on our lives and for the inspiration that he gave us, I think many of us will join me when I say we thank him. And our thoughts, of course, are with his family at this time. Okay, so we leave that somewhat somber story to move on to our community question of the week, Neil. And last week's community question of the week was, what game caused you to move from the Amiga to the ST or PC? Uh, as is predicted, we got lots and lots and lots of answers on this one, Neil. Uh, we're going to lead things off with Quinn Mang, and he says, Commodore Company was in flames. People screaming, everybody get out now. <laughs> Donning my flame-proof clothing, I held on to my Amiga 500 for dear life. My A500 survived Sierras and others sometimes lazy PC ports to Amiga. It survived the next generation of Amiga AGA computers. With a death grip, I held on to rumors of an even newer AAA chipset. Surely it's coming. Doom and the Chunky versus Planar debate. I can live without Doom, I think. Now this must hold on. And then talk of who was picking up the remains. The CEO of Commodore UK, David Pleasance, ESCOM, who were they? Gateway PCs. And then came Windows 95. Ooh, pretty. Oh. I slowed down, looked back at the last few years of gaming on the PC, looked into my adult life and the PC standard, and with a great sigh, I finally sat down and sadly put my aging Amiga up for sale so I could join the world of Microsoft and IBM compatible PCs. Uh, the hype. It's hard to explain to people the hype that was around Windows 95 when it came out. You mm -hmm. know, it was mm -hmm. huge. Um, however, it's not a game. We were talking about what game caused you to move. So we can only assume that he loved the built-in pinball game so much. <laughs> that's right. That that's what persuaded him to move to Windows 95. <laughs> a, 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 mean, a, a mean game of free sell was what... <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That, that's what persuaded them. <laughs> uh, Warshi7819 says, I actually went from my C64 to PC, and that was driven by productivity software. I remember my first game of Transport Tycoon that was also on the Amiga, Day of the T Green Tentacle and Doom 2. After turning the PC or after tuning the PC to run Wipeout, which he says was hours and hours of quote unquote fun, and finally Quake. Uh, and he said, how fast the market and demand for hardware changed back then. At six, a uh, six to 12 month old PC felt really old. Yeah, I mean, so. those first three games, Doom, Day of the Tentacle and Transport Tycoon. I mean, what, a, what a combo. I mean, those are big hitters. Those, those are games mm -hmm. that will keep you playing for years and uh, um, great examples. Uh, I, I was completely addicted to all of them, especially Transport Tycoon. That kept me going for years. Um, off the back of Railroad Tycoon, back on the Amiga I used to play. So Transport Tycoon and a PC. Oh, that was the step up. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, Kess Monkey says, Falcon 3.0. There's a man after your own heart, Neil. Uh, Ooh, yeah. He says, it was the, the first flight sim I played on a PC, which was a 25 megahertz 386SX. And it blew my mind to see a sim running with frame rates higher than single digits. It was so silky smooth by comparison to the sims I've been playing for years on the Amiga, such as F-16 Combat Pilot, Falcon FA-18 Interceptor, and most of the MicroPro sims. But, nice, he says, yeah. it wasn't the PC alone that ended my time with the Amiga. When in a video game store one day, one of the TVs behind the counter had a Sega Mega Drive connected to it. And it was my first time seeing Sonic the Hedgehog outside of magazine screenshots. The colors, the large detailed sprites, the parallax scrolling, and of course, the speed. This was the exact moment I knew my days with the Amiga were numbered. Oh, I mean, I see that as a sideways step. Um, if you're going Amiga to Mega Drive, yes, there are some awesome games on the Mega Drive, but the Amiga has its own strengths against the uh, the Mega Drive. So I see that's a sideways step. That's that's a controversial one for me. What do you think, John? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it, it all depends on what kind of games you like to play. You know, if, if you if you are really into, you know, a, a mascot platformers, uh, the, the Amiga can't hold a candle to you know, the Mega Drive or the, the Super Nintendo. But if you're at all interested in anything that requires a little bit deeper control scheme outside of what you can do with controller, for example, flight sims or you know, games that are heavily dependent on the mouse, you know, something like Lemmings or Cannon Fodder, uh, you're going to be well served to keep that Amiga kicking around because you're going to have a much better experience there. So I think it's a both and situation with the consoles. Yeah. I'm going to find that so, reply and I'm going to, I'm going to downvote that reply, John. <laughs> That's going to be my <laughs> first ever downvote on our subreddit. <laughs> So um, our community question of the week this week, we couldn't do anything different. What did Sinclair computers mean to you? You know, we want to hear all about uh, your experience with the, the any of the Sinclair computers and, and what impact they had on your life. Please post your responses in the subreddit and we'll read the top three most upvoted responses on the air next week. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Stiles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.